So I was working on this like late last night. Yeah. And I found like the area for the middle part. But what I was adding up the. <laughs> so what I did on accident is I was like delirious. Uh huh. Because I was subtracting from the uh, the formula for the area of two cylinders instead of the volume for two cylinders. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> All right, well, it's 9 o'clock. Let's get started. So um, administratively, um, we're going to finish 8.1 today, hopefully get into 8.2. 8.1, I always get bogged down on in 8.1, but it's important that we understand it before we can move on. Um, I'm seriously considering a take-home exam for exam three. I've done that um, twice in the last year or two. I've done take-home exams for exam three. I'm considering it. That would allow us to gain back the day that we're going to lose here by spending more time in 8.1 because we're supposed to start 8.2 today. <coughs> so um, let me think about it a little bit more. I'm leaning towards that. Um, the exam is scheduled for November 9th, which is not this Wednesday, but the following. So that would be something where I, I probably give you that exam on that day and then give you like a week with it. Yeah. What's that? It would be a harder exam than an in-class exam. It would be more difficult problems because you're at home, you get to think about it a little bit more, right? Um, the, the drawback to a take-home exam is that we will continue moving in the class, like continue, and then people do, just get fixated on the test instead of keeping up with the material in class. So I, I don't know. That's what I'm leaning towards. Let's see how today goes. Um, I asked you to do that, those pipes, the intersection pipe problem. If you could uh, turn those in. I only have one student ask me about this, so I think I did say you could talk to me, right? Only, only one person actually asked me a single question on that. So, all right, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Pipe intersection? Last call? Pipe intersection problem, yes? And then as far as the sequences, um, the, the one that I emailed out, the, what was it, five, five problems, trying to come up with the formulas. Um, I know some of you still are working on that, so I won't give you the answers now, but I, I do plan on giving you the answers to these. You should know if you have the answer, right, because you can check it. But um, if you need to talk about that or want to talk to me after class or um, in my office hours, we can discuss that further. Thank you. Now, I wanted, to, I wanted to actually talk briefly about the, the pipe problem because there's all different sorts of approaches. Um, the approach that I was hoping you would take with this was that we, if we were looking for the volume of this whole thing, right, we could first figure out the volume of the blue, the entire cylinder, and the red, and that's just the formula, right? Volume is, uh, what is it, pi r squared times h. So you know the radius. You know the radius of these are, are one, right? And then H would be the distance. And I, what did I tell you? How long are they? Four. So the volume of each one would be the volume of each one would be pi times the radius, which is one squared times four, right? So just four pi would be the volume of each one. But there are two of them, right? That would be that would be if they were separate, if they weren't intersecting. That's what that would be the the whole volume, right? But they intersect each other. So what you have to do is the part that intersects, like if I just if I do um, two of these pipes, right? Both pipes would have a volume of eight pi. Do we agree on that? If they were separate, if they intersect, then whatever the volume of their intersection is, we're counting it twice here, aren't we? So what we need to do is find the volume of that intersection and only count it once. Does that make sense to you? So I need to find the volume of the intersection and subtract it from this. Subtract one of them. Yay okay, or nay? Uh, no? What? 
Okay, so if I have two pipes separately, right? The volume of each of those together is 8 pi, right? These are 4 pi each. That's the volume of each one, right? Now, where they once I put them together and they intersect, then whatever region intersects with each other, maybe, maybe let's do it this way. Let's look at it as a two-dimensional problem, okay? Let's say we have a rectangle, right? Let's say it has, it's one wide and four tall. Then the area of that would be four, agreed? And if I had two of them, one and four, then the area of that would be four. So these together would have a total area of eight. Okay, now let's, let's overlap them. <clears throat> right? So what's, what's the area of this? Well, you have to figure out what the area of that is, right? What's the area of that? What would that area be? What would that be? How wide are these? One, right? So what's the area of that? One. So let's, let's see that over here in this separate picture. That area that we're seeing there, that intersection is being counted twice, isn't it? It's one here and one here. But over here, we only want to count it once. So we want to take, you know, this is eight together, right? So what we want to do is find the area of that, which here would be one, and subtract it from that, so that would be seven. Does that make sense now? Okay. That was the idea. Now, I'll be happy if you could just find the volume of that thing in the middle. I mean, if you can do that, that's, that's really what the crux of the problem is. Find the volume of, of the intersection. Any questions before I proceed with this? So what I recommended is that you, we look at this intersection and that we cut it into eight separate pieces. They're all symmetric. And just try and find the volume of that one piece right there. Okay? That's what I was wanting you to do. Do that, multiply times eight, that'll be the volume of everything. So this was a, this was a cross section problem, right? That's what this was. It was a cross section problem where you needed to <coughs> figure out you had the base of a solid, right? If we look at this solid from, we look at it from the top, right? Like if we look at it from the top, like that, you can see that the base of the solid on the ground, the base of this solid would, would look like this. Right, that's this base of this solid. And we actually know the equation of this line right here. That's y equals x, right? Because it's a perfect diagonal, 45 degrees. So this is y equals x. And then this one right here is y equals negative x because it's just perfect diagonal line but pointed down, right? So those are the two functions, the top and the bottom. And so if I slice this this way with the slice like this, and then look at that cross section from the side, it would be something like, I don't know, what would it look like? It would go up and just be a little piece like this. Right? That's what that would look like if I sliced it. You all understand that? Now, if I take a different slice, let me say my slice is further over this way. If I take that slice, it would be longer than this, right? And not quite as tall, right? Because you have to look at the shape to understand that. This shape, I wish I could draw on this board. Right, do you all see if I take this slice this way and then look at it from the, you know, peel off the part that I cut, right? I cut and then just peel it off, look, it would be a little, a rectangular shape, right? Like this. And the closer you get out to the edge, the wider they get and the, the shorter they are, the closer you get to the middle here, you're going to have a very narrow rectangle, but very tall like that. You all understand? So you just have to find a formula for the volume of one of these. That's it. That's all you need is the formula for the volume of one of those. And we know that the <coughs> distance from, well, we need to know the distance from here all the way to here, right? Does anyone know what that is? Well, what's the distance from here to here? 
it's this function, right? X, right? That's X. And distance from here to here is negative X, right? Or distance would be X. So the total distance is just 2X, right? So I know that, let me erase this one. I know that the base of this solid is 2X. I know how thick it is. It's DX, that's how thick the little piece would be. And this is the, this is the hardest part right here. I mean, if this wasn't already hard, this is the, this is the tricky part. How tall is it, right? How tall, how tall is this piece? Well, this height, think about what this looks like from the side, not from, like if we look at it from, from here, right? Our slices would be coming in like this, right? And the height would be this distance from here to here, right? But isn't this just the arc of a circle that has a radius of one, right? So if you look at that, we all know from, we've done this several times, if you have a circle of radius one, the equation of that circle is y equals the square root of 1 minus x squared. In other words, this is x squared plus y squared equals 1 squared. That's that <coughs> circle. And so the, the height, this distance from here to here, will always be 1 minus, uh, x, sorry, 1 minus x squared square root. So as you, move, as you move across, right, think about it. If, if x is 0, you're over here, right? If x is 0, how tall is it? one, right? If x is all the way to the edge, x is now one, right? And how tall is it? Probably one in for x. Zero. zero. Does that make sense? As you start over here, x is zero, your height will be one, and as you move to the side, all the way to here, the height will eventually go to zero. And that curve is this. So that's how tall it is. That's it. And now you add them all up. So your integral should look like this. Um, you should have integral. All right, we'll get to the, well, we'll do the limits of integration. Where do you start your x? So you're going to start your slices where? Zero, where do you stop? One. Now, how do I know it's one? It's the radius of that other circle, right? So. Um, I'm going to go from 0 to 1, and then do we want to say that there's 8 of these now, or do you want to do that now? Yeah, yeah I mean, because remember, this is only one of, one of the pieces, right? There's 8 of them, 4 on top, 4 on the bottom. So I'll go ahead and put it here, 8. And then I have just, you know, this is, a, we want the volume, so it's just multiply all those together, right? That's it. So we just have um, 2x square root of 1 minus x squared dx right there. And this you can do with basic u sub. You don't even need trig sub for this. Let u be that. The derivative of that's negative 2x. You have that. You're off by a constant. I think this comes out to be 16 thirds. I, I don't remember. I thought I worked it out once. 16 thirds? Yeah. 16 thirds r cubed. Wait, what? Oh, but r is 1. Yeah. So. So yeah, if, uh, so this should turn out to be 16 thirds and you multiply by this, I guess. Or, or is that with this? I don't remember. That's with this eight? Yeah, whatever. Anyway, that's it though. This right here would be the volume of the intersection of those two pipes. And so you take that answer and you'd subtract that from the volume of both, which was what, eight pi? Was it eight pi? And that would be your volume. Looking buff today. <laughs> All right, so look, I, I, I don't want you to look at this as like, oh man, a quiz. if you didn't get it, I'm not, it's really more, I wanted to see if you could think through this and could you get it to the, to the slices? That was the whole thing, is can you see how this ties into what we've, what we learned about those cross sections, All right? Yes? There might be some other ways um, to do this. I mean, I would have to, we would have to look at it to see how you did it. I mean, this to me is the clearest way to do it. Well, yeah. But to, now looking at this now and having me go through that, does everyone see it makes sense to, to have the base of the solid be, be that right there, right? And then to just do your little cross sections and find your formula, you know? 
Okay, we got to move on. Talk to me after class if you have any questions on that. All right. All right, so we, uh, we have a lot to do. Eight point, I was looking at it last night, I was looking at it this morning, it's just, it's so much to do. So I don't want to rush, so, but I also, we need to move. So if, if you have questions, please just let me know. If I'm going too fast, say, hey, hey, hold on, hold on, all right? All right, so last class what we did was, if you have your pipe quiz, please turn it in. Um, last time we were talking about sequences, right? And we spent a lot of time with me giving you a sequence and then trying to come up with formulas. And now we need to get down to some other business with it. We, we ended with factorial, right? Yes. We ended with factorial. And I showed you this very nice property that if you take n plus 1 factorial, that that's equal to n plus 1 times n factorial. I ended class with that. Right? I showed you why that's true. I want to show you how you can use something like this in, in some algebra that we're going to need later. All right? So let's say, we, let's say as an example we have this. Let's say we have 2n plus 3 factorial over 2n plus 1 factorial. I would like for us to, to simplify this. All right? First, let's write down what this is. Um, let's just see what this actually turns out to be. Remember what factorial means. You start with this number, right? Then you multiply by one less than that. Then you multiply by two less than that. Then three less than that. Then four less than that. Then five less than that. All the way until you get down to one, right? So my first multiplication here would be 2n plus 3. <coughs> then I'd multiply by 2n plus what? Two, two right? I subtract one. Now when I subtract 1 from this, I'm only subtracting it from the 3, right? Because 2n is a variable expression. You subtract 1, you can only subtract it from the 3. So it becomes 2n plus 2. Then the next one, 2n plus 1. The next one, 2n. Next one, 2n minus 1. And then we keep doing this, right? 2n minus 2, 2n minus 3. And then we go dot, 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 and we're going to stop when we get to 1, right? That's what the numerator really means, right? Questions on that? All right, what is the denominator? Well, go ahead, 2n plus 1, 2n, 2n minus 1, 2n minus 2, and then that's going to keep going until we get down to 1, right? Do you see that there's a bunch of stuff that cancels? Yes? yes? Basically, because 2n plus 3 is slightly bigger than 2n plus 1, what happens is, as I start to break this down, eventually I get to 2n plus 1. You see that? And so this would cancel, this would cancel, this would cancel, this would cancel. All this cancels. So all that's left is this, right? That's all that's left. But the bigger thing that you need to see here is this. What is this right here? How could I rewrite everything right there? What's 2n plus 1 times 2n times 2n minus 1 all the way down to 1? What really is that? 2n plus 1 factorial. That's 2n plus 1 factorial. Good. So a condensed way of me writing this would be 2n plus 1 factorial, right? I could write it that way. And then do you see that if I do it that way, it would have canceled with that right away, right? This right here. It just would have, they just would have canceled. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start this problem over. I'm going to show, show you the way you should do this. This was just to kind of get you to see why things do, are about to behave the way they do. If I were given 2n plus 3, parenthesis factorial, over 2, oop, 2n plus 1. If you have your pipe quiz, if you happen to do the pipe quiz, I need that now, please. 2n plus 1 factorial. So what I would do is I'd say, hey, look, 2n plus 3 is bigger than 2n plus 1. So I'm going to start peeling off pieces of this, all right? So I'm going to start writing 2n plus 3. Gosh, I can't write. 2n plus 3, and then 2n plus 2, and then here, 2n plus 1. But instead of writing the rest of them, 
I'm going to put a factorial right here, and that factorial is on that right there. So I know that 2n plus 1 factorial really means basically everything in red, right? It's, it represents everything from there down. And then I put that on top of the 2n plus 1 factorial, and then they cancel. Questions? Yes? Would this happen every time the numerator is larger? If this was larger than this, then that's what would happen. Now, if I flipped it over, right, what if it was flipped over and the 2n plus 3 was on the bottom? I would do the same thing. I would leave the numerator alone, and I would start breaking down this denominator, and then they would still cancel, but this stuff would be on the bottom, and we'd have a 1 on top. So it would be the reciprocal of this. Any other questions? All right, we'll get more practice with that, all right? Uh, the one that we will see a lot in this class, the one that we see the most, all right, just so you, you can't say I never showed you, the one that we see almost, almost every time that we do these certain types of problems in um, this section on, um, what is it for? Whenever we're running what's called the ra uh, ratio test, which will come later, um, we see this pop up a lot. n plus 1 factorial over n factorial. That right there. We see that a lot. And so do you see how n plus 1 is bigger than n? Right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite the top as n plus 1. And now subtract 1 from that, you get n, right? But I'm not going to write the rest. I'm just going to put factorial on the n. And that will cancel here with this n factorial down here. These cancel, and you get n plus 1. So n plus 1 factorial over n factorial is just going to be n plus 1. A another way you could see this is if I did 8 factorial, let's say, over 7 factorial. Notice 8 is one more than 7, right? This would be 8 times 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, but that, the rest of the way is just 7 factorial, right? And then on the bottom you have 7 factorial, and then they cancel, you just get 8. All right, we good? All right, <clears throat> so now the next thing we need to talk about um, is visualizing what a sequence actually is. So we talked last time that a sequence is a function, right? A sequence is a function. The input are the natural numbers, the output are just whatever, right, numbers. And so we said if you try and visualize, it, visualize this graphically, these are not functions like our traditional nice continuous functions. These are just um, a bunch of dots, right? So I have an example here, Let me make this a little bit, I don't know how this is going to work. Do you all see the, uh, the sequence here? Negative 1 to the n times n squared. Negative 1, a sub n, is negative 1 to the n times n squared. So we could just start plugging in values for n, right? We always start with what? 1. Right, if you plug 1 in here, what would happen? Negative 1, and then 1 squared would be 1, so you just get negative 1, right? If you plug in 2, you would now have negative 1 squared, that's a positive 1, and then 2 squared is 4. So that's the sequence, negative 1, then 4, then negative 9, then 16, then negative 25, and so on and so forth, right? So what would that look like if we tried to graph it? Well, this is it right here. That's the graph. Notice it's not like a nice curve I can draw, right? If I plug in 1, I got, what was it, negative 1? You can't really tell, that dots down just a little bit. I plug in 2, I get 4. Plug in 3, I get negative 9, 4, positive 16, 5, negative 25, positive 36, negative 49, and so on and so forth, right? That's the graph. That's the graph of that sequence. Now, I can, I can, do, uh, I can do more points. You get the idea. I don't think I really need to do this, but you get the idea of what this sequence is doing, right? It is an alternating sequence, correct. It's alternating because it goes, in this case, it was negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, right? So you can see what it's doing, right? Like this. All right. Let's look at another one.
This one, um, I've made it so we can basically make up any, any sequence we want and put it in here. So um, let me, how about if we just do n? What's the sequence a sub n equals n? Yeah, it would, it would just be that, right? Now it's not, this is not drawn to scale, like it doesn't look like a 45 degree line, right? But I plug in one, I get one. I plug in two, I get two. I plug in three, I get three. That's a sub n is n, right? But it's dots, not a solid line, right? Um, how about sine of n? How about sine of n? Is that gonna be an alternating sequence? Think carefully. Will that alternate? Let's, let's try it. Sine of n. Whoa. Okay. Why is this not? There we go. <laughs> All right. So there we go. Let me go some more points. Let me go 50 points. Look at that. So look. If I were to graph the sine function right now, if I were to graph it, the sine function would be in here. It would be in here, okay? But notice that your points are not going like positive, negative, positive, negative. Sometimes, like here, looks like we have two positives, three positives, then negative, 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 positive, 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 negative, 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 right? Do you see that it's not positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative? So this is not an alternating uh, sequence. What else? How about this one? This is a cool one. How about n over um, e to the n? So that one looks like it's headed towards, oh, you know what? Let's make it alternate. That'll be cool too. Let me, let me make this alternate. So negative one raised to the n. Oh, no, it didn't like that. Oh, I see why. There we go. Let me just do like 25 points. So this is an alternating, um, this is an alternating sequence. What's happening is in the beginning, we got this point, ne negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, and it keeps doing this. You see that? So that was negative, ne that's negative one to the n times n over e to the n. That's the visual representation of that sequence. And we can keep going, all right? Um, so this brings us to the, uh, a major point now in this section. What is the limit of a sequence? So remember in Cal 1, right? We learn about limits, <laughs> limits of functions, right? And we say, hey, we're going to let x go to some number, right? Let x go to some number and figure out what the, what the function is doing. We want to do the same thing with the sequence now, except that we only are interested in what happens to the sequence as we go further and further out. We only want to know what happens when n gets huge. Does the sequence go somewhere or not? Right, so first the, first the definition, and again, you don't need to copy this all down, but there's some stuff here, some language we need to be clear with. So given a sequence, right, given a sequence a sub n, we will say the sequence has a limit of L if when we take the limit as n goes to infinity, right, not x, if we let n go to infinity in the sequence, we get some number. So if we do a limit, we let n get huge. If it goes to a number, then we say that sequence um, has a limit. And in that case, we will write a sub n with an arrow pointed to L. That will tell everyone, hey, this sequence goes to some number L. And we will say verbally that a sub n converges to L. Now, if that limit doesn't exist, which we know limits sometimes can't exist or don't exist, then we will say a sub n, the sequence, diverges. So we have this, this concept now of convergence and divergence of a sequence. 
and it depends on whether or not the limit exists or not. All right? So let's take a look at some examples visually first. Look at this sequence. See the sequence? Do you see that as n goes to infinity, so as I go further out, it appears that the sequence is approaching 1. So here's zeros down here off the graph. But do you see up here at 1, it looks like we're like asymptotically approaching 1 the further we go? Visually, it should make sense to you that this sequence a sub n goes to 1. That's the notation. It converges to 1. Look at this one. This one, in the beginning, it's kind of like scattered, isn't it? Scattered, but the further I go out, do you see that even though we're scattered, and even though we're kind of above and below, do you see it's kind of like narrowing down and getting closer to zero? Sometimes a little bit above zero and below, but we're getting closer and closer the further we go. In this case, we would say as n goes to infinity, the sequence, right, approaches zero. Questions on that visually? That one is not quite the same, right? It's a little bit different. But again, do you all see that it's approaching zero? It does not matter that the points are sometimes above and below. It's as you go further this way, they're narrowing down. They're, they're kind of being funneled into like this little narrow channel getting closer to zero. All right, so how about, how about something that doesn't converge? Look at that sequence. That's the sequence, um, just so you know what it is, that's the sequence a sub n equals negative 1 to the n. What happens when you plug in 1 here? You get negative one. What happens when you plug in two? Positive one. Three? Negative one. Four? Positive one. Five? Negative one. Right? That's what this is doing. Is that converging? As I go to infinity, is it headed to one number? No. It needs to be headed to one number and one number only. And in this case, it's not. So we would say that this sequence diverges. Make sense? All right. Theorem. This is very, very important to us, all right? So look, everything we did in Cal 1 when we were doing limits required that we were working with functions. And that was especially important when we brought in L'Hopital's rule, right? Remember L'Hopital's rule? Because for L'Hopital's rule, you use the derivative, don't you? You take derivative of top and bottom. Okay, well that is, if you take the derivative of a function, aren't you 